Good evening. Welcome to the May 2nd, 2012 meeting of the Murfreesboro Planning Commission. We have a quorum present, so I'll call the meeting to order at this time. First item on tonight's agenda is to approve the minutes of April 18th, 2012. Are there any additions or corrections to those minutes? Hearing none, I'll declare them approved as submitted. We have two items under the staff reports tonight, the first of which is proposed amendments to the zoning ordinance to create the city core overlay otherwise known as the CCO district. Mr. Adelot, good evening. Thank you, uh, Chairman Lamb and members of the Planning Commission. This uh, is uh, something that the uh, planning staff has been working on uh, probably for about the uh, past year, actually a little over a year. We uh, had a neighborhood meeting with uh, the neighborhood of the area that we've been calling the South Manny Study Area back last summer. And since that time, we've been first worked on a study of the uh, zoning in the area, identifying what the problems were, identifying what some of the, uh, I guess, challenges are for the area and how some of our current zoning uh, came about and what is, how it's applied to the property. Uh, that was presented to the uh, Planning Commission in uh, December and then January. We talked about it. And out of that has grown these specific amendments to the zone ordinance. And what I'm doing tonight is to brief you on it, have some discussion, talk about the map, and then set a course, uh, a chart, a course for achieving um, possibly implementation of this. Uh, first part of what I wanted to show you is what you had in your agenda materials. And this is also available on our website under our agenda package. So anybody that might be interested at home uh, who's watching this, can get on our website, call up the Planning Commission's agenda, and they can get the very same information that you've got. Uh, the first part is the uh, staff comments. There are about six pages or so of staff comments, and included with that is uh, sort of a, a schedule of uh, meeting dates and, and things that need to happen between now and, and probably December to see this adopted. And part of that is a neighborhood meeting again at Patterson. The second thing <coughs> is a draft of these proposed amendments. Excuse me. <coughs> I knew that happened about the time I got started talking tonight. <coughs> these uh, drafts are labeled draft because they're still in a malleable form. I say malleable in the sense that they're changeable, that they can be changed to address the, the things we learned during the process and also address the things that may concern you as members of the Planning Commission. This draft has been reviewed by our city's legal staff. They've looked at it. Uh, they made uh, numerous comments with me, uh, sort of helping shaping it into a, uh, a format that will fit our zone ordinance. So it's still a draft. It's changeable. The, uh, another thing that's in here are a couple of exhibits, and then we have a, a, uh, a map. One of the exhibits is an uh, excerpt from Chart 2, that I'm going to talk about in more depth, that talks about the uses that are permitted in the city, listed in Arizona ordinance, and then it talks about the uses that would be uh, prohibited and uses that would also be allowed in some of the, the zones that exist in the area. And I'm going to go into that in a little bit more detail in just a moment. So that's what you've got in your materials. It helps to explain uh, what I'm proposing. Uh, Basically, what we're talking about doing and what staff is proposing is to create an overlay district that will apply over uh, a large part of the study area. And for now, the study area has included the area that's bounded on the west by South Church Street, on the north by East Main Street, on the uh, east by uh, Middle Tennessee Boulevard, on the south by Mercury, and uh, Southeast Broad Street. So it's, it's a pretty large area, and that's the area that we've really included in the study area uh, for uh, really evaluation. Not all that area is going to be recommended to be included in this. And there's a map at the end of this, uh, if you're looking for it, that's where I'm going to talk about uh, as a second agenda item. Now what we're going to propose is that this overlay district will uh, be possible to overlay over land that was uh, developed uh, basically before the mid-1950s. The reason I've chosen that year is because in the mid-1950s, actually in the late 1940s, the city adopted its first zone ordinance. And then in the late 1950s, it uh, created a second zone ordinance. And it, it sort of ramped up the requirements. It became more restrictive. Zoning was new at that time. And a lot of the uh, area, the study area, particularly to the south and to the uh, east, 
was really undeveloped or very newly developed, and was developed to some of the early standards in 1957 or so. So uh, uh, some of that area really would, would fall into a, a vintage at or about the mid-1950s. It is very possible that after we've gone through this process uh, in, in a Dutch world we do, that we may want to apply it to other areas in our community that predate or, or are of a similar vintage. For instance, the area uh, north of East Main Street, along Maple Street, along uh, uh, Spring Street. I'm not saying we will. I'm not saying we won't. I'm identifying that it's a possibility. And I want you to keep that in your mind as you look at this. I want Because if we ever want to create a second district, I don't want to start from scratch unless it is unless it really is viewed as genuinely different. And there are a lot of very um, real similarities between the two areas uh, in terms of the way the lots are configured, in terms of the way the streets are oriented, in terms of the uh, 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 the age of the homes. Uh, so that there's some similarities there that exist that might benefit from the same treatment. And I say might. I want to save that for another day another series of neighborhood meetings, another time for people to participate. Because if today if we tried to apply it over that area, I think it would be unfair to the people who reside there because we haven't let them know we're really studying their area. So that's off the table for now. I just want to plant that seed as a possibility. The overlay that we propose would not apply to areas for, for new development. It would not apply to greenfield development. I don't think it would be appropriate. In the areas that are new, like the areas off of South Church Street, uh, in and around uh, maybe the uh, uh, Innsbruck area or the Indian Hills area or the areas north of Murfreesboro around Regency Park, those have been developed to our 1984 standards. They're set up well. They're designed for it. That zoning works and does not need to be really tinkered with to the extent that this is. So this would not apply to those type of areas, and I don't think, and I want, I want you to keep that in mind. If someone came in saying, "Well, I want to be zoned for that, so I can do the things that are allowed in in uh, uh, the overlay," well, maybe we should be looking at that as more of a, a a planned development approach or something else instead of an overlay approach. The um, proposed name is currently being considered as the City Core Overlay. Uh, it's possible that we may want to call it something else. As we go through this process, I want to create a name that people uh, like, that feels warm, that, that, that when you speak it, it doesn't have an odd feel in your mouth. Uh, it has been one of my um, observations as a planner that one of the worst phrases that we have is urban sprawl. That very name seems to indict the city for doing something wrong. And it's, it's really, urban sprawl is not a, a city phenomenon. It usually happens in rural areas. But somehow or another, when they say urban sprawl, it becomes a, uh, an indictment against all municipalities. So I want to create an acronym that when it's said, people aren't intimidated by it or feel bad about it. So we want to be careful about a name. So for right now, we're calling it the City Core Overlay. It may be that we choose something else. And I think that the people who participate in the public hearings and the neighborhood meetings are going to be encouraged to help us to decide what it should be called. So that's sort of the first part of, of the uh, ordinance. And in the, as you go into the uh, draft, you notice that there's an intent and a purpose, and then the application of the regulations. And that's basically uh, the, the purpose is to, to change the um, way we apply our regulations our zone ordinance in this defined area. It's also it, one of the things it says is uh, that it is um, it is recognized that the land within the city core overlay district is already predominantly developed, and that in order for there to be beneficial redevelopment of existing properties, relief from the otherwise applicable standards may be necessary. And I've written that into this on purpose because I want to spell out. It's talking about relief from problems uh, that may be necessary. And instead of having to go to the BZA for variances, and I'm, I'm looking at a representative on the Board of Zone Appeals, I'm trying to create a way that's hard written into our zone ordinance there. So uh, with that first uh, bullet point, are there any, any questions about that part of it? Okay. What I want to go into now is the, the second part. And this is something that we, we'll, we may want to have some more discussions, uh, e either maybe later or in, in something that we're going to want to discuss with the neighborhood. And that is about the uses permitted. In the, in the uh, ordinance, we're, we're talking about that it is proposed that the uh, uses uh, in the uh, 
in this proposed overlay district will remain the same as those in the underlying zone districts. For instance, in the RS8 zone, the RS8 uses permitted single family homes are still permitted. Uh, in uh, the uh, uh, commercial highway, the things that are allowed in commercial highway are still permitted, except for the limitations or additions that are specified in these regulations. For instance, on page two of the draft, there are, it begins with a list of uses that are proposed to be excluded from anywhere in this district. And among them, fraternities and sororities, motels, airports, pet cemeteries, carnivals, communication towers, drive-in theaters, fireworks retailers, greenhouse nurseries, kennels, liquor stores, lumber and building materials, motor vehicle sales, pawn shops, uh, pet funeral homes, TV transmission towers, regional shopping centers, regional uh, community shopping centers, drive-in restaurants. A drive-in restaurant is something like a Sonic, but not, not necessarily like a, like a McDonald's. Th th and there's a difference, and, and I will explain a little bit of why these uses were chosen. Uh, taxidermy studios, wholesale and record service, record service storage yards. A whole list of uh, industrial uses like uh, animal and poultry slaughtering and rendering in stockyards. The, the, the things that I put on this list come from two sources. One, some of these are uses that are also excluded from the uh, Gateway Overlay District. Some of uses. Some of these uses are what I would consider to be uh, impediments in a pedestrian environment. Something like a uh, regional shopping center has no business being located in this type of area. Uh, in a regional shopping center is a place that may be sort of like Stones River Mall. What we don't want is someone coming in there and buying just blocks and blocks and then just uh, redeveloping or, or wanting to. Uh, on the other hand, we might. But if they did come in, I think I'd like to see that as, a, as an opportunity for the community to have a voice in, in what's going on, maybe to a degree that, that they don't currently have. Uh, s things like a, a drive-in restaurant is a pure vehicle use. It's a, what the planners say, uh, auto-centric. But for the automobile, it would not survive. A drive-in restaurant is some place that you drive into, sit in your car, order your meal, and they bring it to your car where you sit there, and you can eat it if you want to, or you can go. It's not a dry, it's not a takeout restaurant. It is Sonic. And, and Sonic is a very good business, but it has no business being in a pedestrian environment. Motor vehicle sales. They are a parking lot that dominates the street front that becomes another obstacle to pedestrian use. And part, part of what is the, the real, I guess the real genius, if you will, uh, of this area is that with the size of the lots, with the uses permitted, with the type of sidewalks, with the type of streets, it could become a very pedestrian-friendly environment, much like the downtown. Uh, where people can win the shop, where people can access, uh, where they can walk to a restaurant. So w w the uses that I've tried to exclude fall, uh, will, will contradict that objective. Now, one of the challenges to you is, as we talk about the uh, uses permitted, you need to maybe chime in and give us some feedback as staff, uh, me in particular. If you see uses and you think, no, 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 really, that ought to be allowed in that area. Or, or, you know, there are other uses on the on chart one ought to be excluded. So at this point, I want to bring up this chart, uh, this excerpt. And this is, it, it's not labeled chart one, but it does say up here in the upper left-hand corner, uses permitted. Now, this is an excerpt from our zoning ordinance that I have, um, that I have um, edited for, as, a, as an exhibit. The uses permitted in all the zones across the top, like RS-15, RS-10, RS-4, uh, OG, commercial local, these are zones that are in that immediate area or within the study area. The uses along the uh, left-hand side, all those are, are listed in the zone orange, and if it has an X in a column, that means that that is a use that's permitted by right. If it has an S, it requires approval by the Board of Zone Appeals. If it's blank, it's a use that is not allowed in that district. Now, for the purposes of explaining what uh, we're proposing, uh, this list of uses, if it has bold letters and has a line through it, it is proposed by me and staff that this use be excluded from anywhere in this district. For instance, you notice uh, fraternity, sorority, one of the, list, the uses I listed, excluded. So, and you on all the way through here. So that's a handy use. 
as you study this, if you see something, and no need to study it today. You can do this over the next couple of days, next week or so. Uh, if you see something and you say, you know, that ought to be excluded or that ought to be included, let me know. Uh, we'll discuss it. It may be that I know something about applying it that, that you just may not have thought about. It may be that it is a defined term in the zone ordinance, and I'm, I might need you to study the definition. So uh, before we make a decision. So study up on that. Now, the, the next part of the ordinance that I want to talk about is the uses that we are proposing to allow that are not currently allowed. And this goes to the heart of one of our problems in the uh, commercial highway district, for instance. A large part of the area within the study area that is zoned commercial highway has single-family houses upon it. Those property owners who own single-family houses on land that is zoned commercial highway are in a very vulnerable situation. If their house were to be damaged or destroyed, they could not rebuild it under the commercial highway zoning. Uh, although they may have lived there for many years, may, even though they may have their life savings in it, even though it may be insured, they could not rebuild their property because it's a non-conforming use and it does not conform to the zone requirements. Many of those lots are so small that if they uh, were to try to conform them to a uh, commercial use, they would be hard-pressed to meet the zoning requirements for what's in the commercial highway district as the commercial highway district exists today. Uh, an example, the lot may be 40 foot wide and it may be uh, 50 foot deep. And you think, well, there's not many like that. Well, there's, 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 there's several out there. That's only a 2,000 square foot lot. Now you try to put a business on there and try to get you some parking spaces on there, and you try to get you some landscaping on there, you, 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 well, you've already failed. You can't do it. You can't sell that lot to somebody, who, somebody else who might do it. So what we're, what we're proposing is, what I'm proposing, one of the fixes is that we allow residential uses in the commercial highway zone within this overlay district. Now, I don't believe we need to allow residential uses universally within the commercial highway district all over the city? You might ask that question. We don't need to create a situation where people have uh, single family homes or even two family homes fronting directly on Broad Street within a commercial area. It, it will be sort of like a situation we dealt with a couple of years ago near the jail. Beside the jail there was a mobile home park. It was in an area that was otherwise zoned industrial. But we had this mobile home park. And the jail, which is a very appropriate use in an industrial area, wanted to build an accessory use for a shooting range. The sheriff patrol, the deputies, the uh, police officers in the community need a place to qualify without having to leave the community to go to a range. Who complained about the noise? The people who were in the mobile home park. Because uh, they, that's where they slept, that's where they were, lived. So we put them in a situation where they, we allowed them to go into a place where maybe we should never allow them to go. That decision was made before any of you all were on the planning commission. But it was one of the legacies that we had to deal with. And it became an incompatible use. So I don't want to allow re residential uses up and down Broad Street or in Old Fort Parkway because we'll create that kind of environment where, well, you allow the house. Now you're responsible for maybe curtailing some of this commercial activity that makes it miserable for me to live here. So within the, within the GDO, I'm proposing this, but I'm also excluding other uses that would be detrimental to it. So think about that balance. Exclude uses that might be out of sort for the area, but allow these commercial uses. Also, I believe, and this is something others may view differently, and this is where I need feedback from you in the community, I believe that, that we need to allow, in the area close by to the uh, downtown, more residential uses. This commercial highway collar, if you will, on the east side of the public square in the downtown uh, does not allow residential uses today, but there are some very, very good places for there to be some um, um, mm -hmm. multifamily housing created. I bring to mind a couple of years ago we saw a condominium development that was proposed on West Main Street. It was a really good use and it became a real early victim of the, uh, the economic downturn. 
if things had not faltered economically, we would have seen a really nice uh, and very beneficial use in the downtown. What I'm striving for is to allow that by right, that type of use by right, in the area on the um, east side of the downtown, which would be on the west end of this area. So let's keep that in mind as part of what, what, what I'm proposing. So you'll notice that in this chart, the uh, one that I gave out, you notice these green uh, letters. Anything that's green is a use that currently exists, but that is not currently permitted in the areas that are marked in green in the columns. So that's part of uh, what I'm trying to accomplish there. This is a sort of a subjective thing. These two things about uses permitted are subjective. It's going to become the rules of how people are allowed to use their land. And we're talking about changing it here. So when we change it, we need to go into it studied. We need to go with our eyes open. And if there's any questions, I want you to have the benefit of my thinking, and I want to have the benefit of your thoughts. So we don't have to have it today, but I want, I want, to, I want you all to maybe, uh, as part of your assignment over the next couple of days, look at it and give me a call back. Now, moving on to uh, number three, and this has to do with the commercial highway. Inside the zone ordinance today, there is the RM22 zone. We've not used it very many times. RM22 will allow about 20 units per acre. Uh, we have one RM22 zone, and it's out there around the uh, golf course. It's, it's never been used. We've never seen anything developing in it. We have RM16, which we very frequently see development in. What I'm proposing is that the density and the uh, bulk regulations in the commercial highway zone for multifamily be very similar to the RM22. It's closer to the central. It's an area where we have on-street parking available. So it, it, it's an area that would survive. So the density for the commercial highway and the commercial, well, actually the commercial highway would be comparable to, to RM22. The... Uh, Bulk regulations in the commercial highway and the commercial local. One thing that I've also prepared for you is an excerpt from chart, uh, yeah, chart two. Chart two are the bulk regulations. And you will have seen this chart in the uh, materials. It's not labeled as chart two, but it is an excerpt from chart two. The, the red text is what we're proposing to be the bulk regulations for the commercial highway within the overlay zone and for the commercial local in the overlay zone. And what I have done is I've given you the bulk regulations for the commercial highway and other parts of our community uh, that are uh, universally applied. And that's in black. The black text is what exists. The red text is what would be proposed for the overlay district. And you'll notice a couple of things that, real quickly. In the commercial local zone, we're proposing that the required front setback be 10 foot from the front property line rather than 30 foot or 42 foot that would be otherwise applicable in the community. You'll notice the same thing for the commercial highway that actually for commercial uses, 5 foot. Now what we're, what we're proposing is, this comes back to the walkable community, we are proposing to allow a property owner to pull their building to the front setback. After all, this is not going to be on Broad Street. This is not going to be on Oak Fort Parkway, where the traffic speeds are fast. This is going to be more like the downtown, where people will be able to walk on the sidewalk. So we're proposing that the front setbacks be much less. Now, you can put your building back further if you want to. There is not a maximum setback. It's a minimum setback. We are going to invite people who may be developing um, their property, that if they sit close to the street, to be able to put seating out front of their buildings, much like we've experienced in the downtown. Well, uh, during uh, my uh, time as planning director, which is increasingly becoming a long time, one of the best ideas that we've seen to have had and came from the downtown property owners wanting to have outdoor seating. Mm -hmm. A very pleasant environment. If we're going to have a pedestrian environment, and in, encourage people to redevelop their property, shouldn't we reward them by giving them the ability to do that on their property? And that's one of the things that I'm proposing through this, this type of approach.
So these will become the bulk regulations for the GDO, excuse me, not the GDO, but the CCO, Commercial Core Overlay, Commercial Highway, and Commercial Local. So that's um, um, on number uh, three. Now, number four, I want to refer to the, uh, I'm going to give you a page number to, to move to. Mr. Adelot, when you say number four, where are you? Uh, on the uh, staff comments, which would be at the bottom of page two of the staff comments portion. Because I've gone through this, I've kind of got my pages in disarray. He's on the Please bear with numbers. me. What we're what we're going to talk about here will be the um, the bulk regulations for in this uh, area that are going to be a little bit different than what we've experienced in some of the other areas. And this is what we call the minimum lot requirements, minimum yard requirements, and land use intensity regulations. Uh, the first of the three is what I call residential structures and residential zones. One of our problems uh, within the uh, uh, study area has been that there are a lot of structures that are much closer to the street than the zoning currently allows. And these go back to before <laughs> we ever had zoning. And as you drive through the neighborhood, it looks rather normal. It doesn't look offensive. It doesn't look out of kelter. And then occasionally you come by a house that sits, well, maybe you see a, a, a ranch brick house that sits back off the street, uh, maybe 40, 30 or 40 foot, beside two houses that are only 10 foot off the street. And it's like, well, what's going on here? This house looks out of place. In Mitch and Nelson, that same house would look great. It would, it would be the norm. But in this area, it's out of place. But what happened was, sometime after 1957, someone came in to get a building permit. They had a house planned for a ranch house. The zoning required a 30-foot setback. They built what the zoning required and the house plan they had, and it doesn't fit the neighborhood very well. What we're proposing is to allow for someone on this, rather than requiring a rigid 30-foot setback, we're going to allow them to have a 10-foot setback uh, or the average of what's beside them. If there are two houses and one is 12 foot and one is 10 foot, you can be 11 foot. So it would be the average of the houses beside you. And if you're on a corner, you will be what is right beside you. And it's designed to keep the houses so that you don't have that gap tooth of, of, of situation. Yes, you can put your house back, but the city's not going to make you put it back where it doesn't need to be. You can still, you're still free to make your own mistake if you want to. People may want to do that. But we're not going to make you. It's not a maximum setback. It is an average setback. And as I've studied this, really a lot of communities do this in other parts of town. Uh, some of the best examples, like Metro Nashville, uh, in the other part of town uh, to the north of the uh, capital, that is the way they do it. Knoxville, Tennessee, that is the way they do it. Memphis, Tennessee, that is the way they do it. They don't do it in the new subdivisions. They do it in the older parts of town, much of which predated modern zoning. Big cities have a lot of these type of areas. That's the approach. It's, it's something I think would be applicable there. Now, moving on in the uh, 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 regulations, the uh, next page, which is page 11, uh, is what I call the uh, commercial structures and uses in residential zones. Now, the residential zones, some of the uses that we're proposing to permit would be like a um, barbershop in a um, RS4 zone. If you build one, you've got to meet the same setbacks as if you were in the commercial local zone. That's just all we're saying. If you're, but if you're a residential, you stick with the residential setbacks. So that's that's commercial uh, uses in residential zones, and then we, of course we have commercial uses in commercial zones, and we've we've already talked about how that would be applied. 
So uh, bulk regulations for these approaches, it's a little bit different than other parts of town, but then again, we've already decided this part of town is a little bit different than other places anyway. Now, number five, and this is from the staff comments, the proposed uh, uh, commercial core overlay, and this is the, our, our interim name, uh, proposes to reduce parking requirements within the overlay district. Right now, if you are in an RS8 zone, you're required to have four parking spaces if you built new. Now, I may be coming to you with a recommendation to change that, but that, you, you just can't achieve it in this area. It is, it is a real penalty. And basically, I'm saying, let's go back to the 1984 approach. To, for residential use, two parking spaces is all that's going to be required. Uh, I'm also saying that uh, in the uh, commercial zones, or in the multifamily zones, uh, we go to a, um, the, basically the 1984 approach also. One for each unit. Because there is on street parking around in this area. We're going back in time to the standard that worked when that area originally developed. Bearing in mind, there's also on street parking allowed in most of that area. And I have talked with our transportation staff about this. This is not something new to them. Uh, also, in the uh, commercial core overlay, we are proposing that if you have on street in front of you and you're commercial, you can get a 25% break on your required parking. Now, at first you say, well, that's not a whole lot, but it, 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 it's really a lot when the whole amount of parking may be small. If you've got a 2,000-square-foot uh, building, you're required to have um, maybe six parking spaces. 25%, you're looking at maybe you, almost uh, two spaces can be on the street. We're also proposing that if you are within 500 feet of a public parking lot, that you uh, will get an even greater break on your required parking. In the downtown Murfreesboro, we have uh, some parking uh, garages. We have some public parking lots. And something that I advocate, although it may be something that come, is a while in, in happening, that the, we might need to, as a city, look at some additional public parking in other areas of our community. Certainly, uh, if the county undertakes a construction project with their judicial system, we will have conversations with them about maybe building some additional parking for the downtown. Uh, but maybe even in this area. Uh, parking is very important, but one of the biggest parking uh, problems is when you don't have any, um, anybody wanting to park in them. Empty parking spaces are a worse situation than full parking spaces. So uh, I kind of leave you with that thought uh, on that subject. So we're looking at some breaks on, on, on parking. And uh, the last thing in the last category on the uh, regulations is landscaping. Landscaping screen, I already made an analogy about if you were trying to adapt a building to a commercial use. You already had your commercial zoning, and you are required to put in a buffer, well, or landscaping. A five-foot landscape strip on two sides of your property, if your lot is only 50 foot wide, that leaves you 40 foot to build in. If you're trying to get a drive to the back of your property so you can get to a loading dock or something, that's another uh, 16 foot. So uh, that's 26 foot off the top before you can build a building. So you've only left with 25 foot. Uh, you're not going to be left with much room to build on that lot. So we're proposing to allow a narrower landscaping strip. Also, if you were adjacent to a residential use and you had to put in a type C buffer, instead of a 5 foot landscape strip, you may have had to put in a 10 foot or a 12 foot or a 15 foot buffer. The real estate itself is one thing. That's a big part of your lot, but that vegetation maturing, it encroaches onto your neighbors. It encroaches over onto your property. So that kind of buffer is a little bit out of place here. There may be other type of buffers that may be better, like we may want to see more fences and fewer uh, pine rows, for instance. Uh, also, one of the things about the vegetation as it matures, it begins to become a little bit of a nuisance. And I think of uh, the area over around the uh, National Health uh, property over off of Bell Street. Several years ago, they had some. They had a had a buffer adjacent to their parking lot, and it had white pines in it. And the white pines did a great job of 
of screening the back. But as those pine trees grew, they began to encroach over onto the neighbors and over into the parking lot, discouraging people from using those spaces, which caused a cascade of problems. The neighbors complained, and then people would park on the street more and more. People complained about not having a place to park. So one day, the guy that maintained the property, he took care of it. I meant to clip my fingers, and I can't do it now, but he took care of it. The trees were cut down. No ifs, ands, or buts. They were gone, and nothing was going to bring them back. But the funny thing was, nobody missed them, except for me and Miss Holloway. <laughs> Everybody else seemed to be glad they were gone, and because they had become nuisances. So in, in, in a real heavy urban environment, a poor selection of a tree species can, in, in a large landscape area can cause problems that you don't, you don't anticipate, and it probably wouldn't be the same in a more suburban environment. In the area off Case and Lane, those commercial areas, those buffers mean a lot. But they've set aside enough land to, for them to mature and for them to grow into. And the, the development happens, and that's more in harmony. But in these urban areas, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a problem. So um, we're, we're talking about backing off on the screening and the landscaping substantially. Now, that doesn't mean we're wanting to get rid of all landscaping. Two things about um, landscaping in the downtown. One of them in the area all the way over to Manny Avenue is in the Main Street uh, master plan area where we encourage street trees. Very similar to what we've done in the downtown. Very similar to what, well, for to you, two of y'all, what Pinnacle did over on Walnut Street. Uh, notice when they rebuilt the parking lot and they added some street parking over there where the little office was, they put in some landscaping, some street trees, and the street trees around the building. That is something we will encourage and work with property owners to do. That's in the Main Street master plan area. A second thing is we're still going to want to see some um, landscaping around the base of the buildings, although if you're going to have outdoor seating directly in front of the building, we may give you a break so you don't have shrubs where people are trying to sit and trying to enjoy uh, the, uh, the ambience. So we're looking at working with people in, in that uh, capacity. So that's a, that's a rundown on the ordinance itself. Uh, you have questions, I want to answer them. Uh, since I've reached out my papers, I may have, if you've got questions now, I may have to take a minute to dig up. But I want to, to see what's on your mind now. We will talk about the map next. Okay. What questions do we have from Mr. Adelon? And, and I'll add this. T today, you know, this is, this is, you're learning. As you digest this and you've heard my explanations, I invite you to give me a call uh, and talk. Uh, about it. Well, first of all, I want to commend the the job you and the staff have done on this. It's taken hours and hours and hours of uh, thoughtful research on your part, and everything. It's a cause and effect thing, just about on everything that you do in this. So, you've got to think it through so carefully, and and you've done a wonderful job so far. So, thank you for getting it this far along already. Mr. Clark, do you have a question, sir? Your timeline. Uh, based yeah. on uh, the presentation tonight, do you feel like that uh, we'll be able to keep this timeline? Yes, sir, I do. I put a lot of thought in this, and this is a um, this is a conservative timeline in that it's um, it's allowing it plenty of time. And, and let me just real briefly touch on what my objective would be. If I need to report back at the uh, mid-month meeting next uh, month, uh, later this month on May 16th. I will. I'm prepared to do that. But either way, I'm prepared to have a neighborhood meeting on July 24th. So that would be my, my first objective, a neighborhood meeting. And in, in advance of doing that, you think, well, that's almost two months off. Well, uh, I want, of course, re reserve a room. We'll get that uh, reserved. Get signs posted. I want to meet with the Main Street Economic Development Committee so they're on board. Uh, we'll need to advertise. I'll get a press release out. We want to do a piece for the cable TV on it. We want to appear on WGNS. That's almost a mandatory stop. Uh, we want to compile a list of affected property owners so we can uh, begin to have a list at the meeting, uh, prepare a place on the website, and prepare exhibits. Now, all the staff will help with that. Um, one of the things that um, I want to stress is that while one staff may, person may work on this, while he's working on this, someone else is doing something else. 
so we, we there's a lot going on. So when, when I'm not available to take phone calls, someone else is taking the calls that I'm not taking, uh, and vice versa. So we'll be uh, we'll be we'll be plenty busy for for about a month there working on this kind of stuff. Then uh, after that, we would like to come back to the plan commission, and uh, we want to have another discussion, see if there's things to change, see if we've gone down a blind alley. If we haven't, if there seems to be acceptance, I'm going to recommend that we have a public hearing. And again, don't want people to think, well, you just heard this through the process. No, we're going to uh, do a lot of the advertising we talked about. We will send notices to every property owner within the area about their property being the subject of a rezoning. Uh, we will get signs up. Uh, we'll try to get on the radio again and, and the same sort of things we did for the, the neighborhood meeting. If that works out, November 7th is the target date that I, I think would be a good time. Uh, I think it would be an appropriate time. It's before the holidays start. It would be a good time for a, a public hearing with the Planning Commission. If that works, we'll take it to City Council. Hopefully we'd have a Council public hearing in sometime late December or early uh, January of 2013. We do that. We will do that to be very careful not to land too close to any holidays because we don't want people to be disqualified from attending. November 7th is a target date. It may be that instead of choosing that date, as we get a little bit closer, we may say, well, let's just have a special meeting to have nothing but this on the agenda because we may have a lot of people who want to participate. So sometime around November 7th is what we would target. Other questions? I think there's so much before us right here now. I think we've kind of we're kind of overwhelmed by the uh, extent of this proposal, Mr. Trade a lot. Well, so we're going to have to get into it. I'm flattered that I might have overwhelmed somebody, but um, I suspect that you all are really wanting to have a chance to study a little bit more and mark your your comments. So when you when you do talk, you are a little bit prepared to uh, to be precise in your questions. Uh, if yes, sir. One quick question, approximately how many residents are in this study area? Ms. Ely, do you have a uh, maybe a rough estimate? You did some research on that early on. I don't know how many residents. I think that we there was about 900 parcels. 900 parcels. Which many were vacant, many were owned by one person or entity. There are commercial ones in there as well, so nobody people don't live in the commercial portions. 900 parcels. It vary in size and shape across the gamut, I'm sure. Yeah. That is a yeah. bunch of people. <laughs> a lot of those. Are you ready to go on to the next item? Yes, sir. I'm ready to go on to the map. You all are ready to go there. Now, and Ms. Ely is going to uh, put that on the uh, television camera so that you look at it instead of me. There you go. The um, map that we're proposing is the area that you see here that's covered with the, uh, or bounded by the dark blue line. Now, that is the area that we are proposing to uh, include in the, um, in the overlay district. It does not include everything that we've studied. And, for instance, in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see uh, a couple of uh, blocks that are marked in brown. Those properties are currently zoned commercial highway. Uh, those properties probably belong in the central business district instead of in the commercial highway district or within this overlay district. And the reason is those are properties that formerly were in the central business district before 1984. The northern block is almost, well, the buildings come out to the property line already. There's a church expansion right now going on for the First Baptist Church. And the little block that fronts over, or the little opening on uh, Spring Street, they're closing it in with a building all the way out to the property line. Uh, so on uh, almost um, three and a half sides of that block, everything comes out to the property line already. It's already Central Business District for all practical purposes. The other block to the south uh, w does include the uh, fire station. It includes a couple of uh, businesses. Some of them have very, very limited parking. Some of them uh, re actually rely on street parking, particularly the front on Academy Street. Some of them uh, really, for all practical purposes, they're central business district also. 
the interesting thing about these properties, like much of the property in the Central Business District, they have public parking available to them. Diagonally across the intersection of uh, East Sevier Street and Spring Street is a city parking lot. A, a free for whoever wants to park there, public parking lot. And then on the other side of that block, Sevier Street, is the city's parking lot. So within literally 50 feet of this uh, block is public parking, which is more typical of the downtown. So rather than putting it in the overlay, it doesn't belong in the overlay, it belongs in the central business district. Uh, Mr. Young, Mr. any of y'all have questions about that? It does include the fire station site. And so our fire station is a non-conforming? It is a non-conforming structure a, at this time. Hmm. And I would say every block, every business, every building on that block is a non-conforming structure also. I think you're right. I don't think you'll have any opposition from the Planning Commission on converting that over. All right. The, the second area that uh, I'm looking to exclude is the, is the little shopping center uh, to the south where Goat's Gym was. Uh, part of it's owned by the Swanson family. Coaches, uh, restaurant, it doesn't belong. It fronts on, on, on Broad Street. And it's really a more modern redevelopment anyway. Also, the area down off of Ash Street, where the uh, Walgreens is, uh, that would, and I'm going in a, a counterclockwise direction here on the map, uh, over there, uh, that's a more modern vintage, and it's also more auto-centric anyway. It now, probably doesn't belong in the overlay district. The area where Gold's Gym was, that's not on our, our map, is it? Uh, actually, it, it's, it's a, a portion of it. The back portion is, but the street that it fronts on is not. It's off, off the okay. edge. In, in preparing this map, it's sort of one of those balancing things. The, the more you include in it, the, the, the smaller things get. Yeah. So I, I, some things are cut out because it was beyond the boundaries. <clears throat> the um, Back up on Ash Street, the, uh, the Walgreens and, and that block being on Broad Street, it, it Yes, they may. A couple of them may be non-conforming, but but the, the ability for them to to redevelop may happen. CVS. I, I said the Walgreens at CVS. We got a Walgreens on the other corner, yeah, another yeah. corner. A CVS, and then we've got the Bradley Elementary, the uh, right Holloway School, the Patterson Park, and the Housing Authority property. They don't belong in the Overlay District either. Then over on the corner of. Um, Mercury Boulevard and uh, Middle Tennessee Boulevard, where the Walgreens and the former Hollywood video is, they, that's more modern development. It doesn't belong in the Overlay District. Then, uh, so that's the areas that w we would exclude from, from, from at this point. Now, uh, bear in mind, at this point, we can always go back and add. We can always go back and exclude. Until we advertise for a public hearing and put a map out there, we can add or exclude. After we've advertised, we can always exclude. We just can't add. So I, I want to leave you with that thought. So if there's something else that needs to be added, let's do it. I don't think it would be appropriate to add anything at this point that has not been included in the former study because I think that would be sort of unfair to the people who might own it unless they were the ones bringing it up to add. But the Gold's Gym coaches area that you were alluding to are not inside the blue line. That is mm -hmm. correct. At this point, I'm 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 not I'm wanting to let those people know that I don't think they need to be included in this at this point. Now, within the study area, there's a couple of changes to the zoning that I'm I'm going to propose that will go in tandem with the overlay. If we don't adopt the overlay, we don't need to do these rezonings. Uh, if we do adopt the overlay, I will be recommending to you that we do these rezonings. And these public hearings for these can go in tandem with the uh, with the um, creation of the district and the zone the property to the district. And for instance, the first is a parcel that fronts uh, South Academy Street that's currently zoned OGR. It's colored green. That property used to be zoned Commercial Highway. I'd say zone it back to Commercial Highway because the new overlay would solve the problems that caused them to seek the OGR zoning. And the same with the parcel that's proposed commercial local to commercial highway that fronts East, State, East Castle Street. 
Both those parcels had houses. Both those parcels were rezoned for the very specific purpose of allowing a property owner to demolish the structure to rebuild their homes using community development funding. Adjacent to those is an area that goes from State Street almost but not quite to Vine Street and then over to um, Manny Avenue and crosses Manny Avenue. That property is zoned RS4. It has a variety of uses, some single family, some um, commercial, some um, resident, multifamily, a cemetery, uh, some church property. I'm proposing that that be rezoned from RS4 to commercial highway. Every property owner is a winner, if in my belief, under that scenario, if we adopt the overlay zone substantially as, as we're recommending it to be done. The multifamily becomes a conforming use. Right now it's non-conforming. The single family would remain a conforming use, and it would give them the option to, to change. The commercial uses would be conforming. Right now they're non-conforming. So it would, it, would, it would help everybody in that area. Plus, it makes the Manny Avenue streetscape more attractive to redevelopment. Right now, the people who are zoned RS4 have no incentive to create a um, pedestrian-oriented commercial use that fronts Manny Avenue, and yet the city has set the stage for that type of positive redevelopment with the reconstruction of the street. I think it's a much more uh, appropriate uh, use, a commercial use, than a single-family residential use. But the property owners will still have that option if they want to do it. All right, so that would be the, the uh, third area. The fourth area would be the area that's uh, colored green almost in the center that's PCD to RM16. That is Jeff's Family Restaurant. It was formerly Glanton's Market. It was zoned to RM16 before, and under the uh, proposed um, amendments, a restaurant would be a use that would be a permissible by a special use permit subject to approval by the BZA if they meet the standards in the ordinance. So uh, that would fix their uh, situation and they would no longer have a situation like they've, they've currently got. If they change their use, like a couple of years ago they decided to increase their parking lot and they had to come back and amend their plan development, they would be free to use the bulk standards and work with staff to do the very same thing within the framework of the overlay district rather than having to come back for an amendment to their plan development. And it won't take away their right to have a restaurant. The um, last area is a small su uh, subdivision called Castleview, uh, proposing to zone it to RS4 and be within the overlay district. <coughs> That's a rundown on the map. These would go through the process. Uh, there are other possibilities, I, I, some things that I don't feel that I want to uh, tackle today, one of them being Davis Market. That may be something that before it's over, well, be, before we ever see it redeveloped, we may actually take it out of the overlay district. It, and I will, I will tell the Planning Commission and the public again, someday I would really think that if we could see something along the lines of the East Main Village where the Boulevard restaurant mm -hmm. has been developed, want to see uh, that type of development on that corner, I will be their advocate if they will be a true upgrade of what's there. I think, I think that corner offers so much more than, than what Davis Market currently is today. Although it's, it's, a, it's a, apparently a good business and a lot of people enjoy it, I really do think that the uh, Boulevard has set a standard that would be very appropriate to that location also. Mr. Adelot, do you think it would be advantageous for, I know in looking at this overlay district, it's quite a large area with so many different parcels. I find myself trying to remember what's in this green area, what's over here on this lot, where is that exactly? Do you think it would be advantageous for us to take a tour at some time as a planning commission and let you uh, present your case in person on representative tracts and parcels to really bring us up to date firsthand on exactly where we are on this. Yes, sir, I do. And, and, and the thanks, of the, I was remiss. I had, something kept nagging at me that I need to include on this timeline. And I think we could probably get that done before the uh, uh, September session when it would come back to you. 
it may be in that time frame between the uh, neighborhood meeting and uh, the uh, September session. But yes, sir, I think it would be very, very beneficial to to do that. I know it helped me. Yeah, mm -hmm. and also, um, Mr. Alot, as as we move forward, I think you've done an excellent job with this map. Could we put points of interest, uh, business, or something to highlight mm -hmm. on this map? Uh, just as a key point as when we're looking at this map? Uh, yes, sir, or, or, or maybe, maybe uh, actually, I, I think we might even just try to do that on our exhibits. Okay. And, and, and as, we, as we begin to distribute them again, we'll, okay. we'll try to do that. <laughs> again, that's sort of a, a balance. You, you put too much on there and you obstruct, obstruct something. But, yes, sir, we can have multiple exhibits so, so that one, some may have it and some may not, but we'll get something that will help you with these points of interest. Landmarks. Yeah, reference uh, points. Yeah, yeah reference points. points. Yeah. You know, I, I, a couple of years ago, I used to uh, find it very amusing when the uh, planning commission members would would tell me that they couldn't see the maps I worked so hard on providing them and reading. <laughs> now I, I don't find that very amusing. In fact, I <laughs> I understand the plight of the um, the planning commission members. So. Uh, <laughs> We, we will we will endeavor to get it where you know it's a balance to read the whole thing. What we we may do later is to have um, bigger exhibits, maybe eleven by seventeen, that will help do it. For tonight's purpose, though, we I didn't see a need to do that. But I think we will be trying to distribute them at the neighborhood meetings. Certainly, I'm not going to go to a neighborhood meeting and have this on this size exhibit on the um, the wall uh, or on a board and try to ask people to read it. It would be it would not be funny. It would not be very productive. We will, we will have large exhibits. And you're correct. People view the uh, their neighborhood not like I do. I've, I've trained myself to view it as from above, like from an aerial photograph or from a map. But they view their neighborhood from the street level. And they, they, they view it from what they see as they pull out of their driveways, as they drive down the streets. And they don't ever see it from the aerial photographs that I, I routinely study. So we can we'll try to be sensitive to that. <coughs> Okay. Anything else under item B under staff reports then? Only if you have questions. I will add, does my timeline seem suitable to you? Yes, there, there's going to be plenty of questions, but I <laughs> have them ready at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else under staff reports, Mr. Adelant, then? Uh, yes, sir. I would like to. Uh, we've got a, a, an item on the mandatory referrals, but while I'm still Let's talking, bring that in under other business. Uh, I've got a. Um, I want to remind you that we have a joint meeting with our city council regarding the airport study. That meeting, I believe, is now scheduled for May 24th at 7 o'clock p.m., and it will be here in the city council chambers. It will be a joint meeting between the uh, council and the uh, planning commission. So it will be jointly presided. I, I do understand that we will have a, uh, in, in, in polling the members to see if you could attend. Uh, we've got a quorum present. I do understand we have a couple that, or, or at least uh, two, that may have a, a conflict. We understand uh, that that may be the case. But um, anybody in the public who, who wants to attend the meeting are going to be welcome to come and listen to this, the report of, on the study. It will not be a public hearing. They will not be invited to speak. But they will be invited to listen and learn, just like uh, we will be doing. Okay. Okay, we'll move on to other business then, Ms. Stradelod. We have one item under that, like you alluded to, mandatory, excuse me, or mandatory referral drainage easement, the villages at Savannah Ridge, Section 1, Lots 17 through 22, and Section 3, Lots 87, 97 through 100, and Lot 130. Uh, Mr. Ives, are you going to do this? Thank you, Chairman Lamb. I'm getting crick in my neck trying to figure out who has it here. <laughs> Members of the Planning Commission, you know, we like to include these in the agenda package when available. Um, we appreciate your indulgence for us to bring this to you under other business. We do have a mandatory referral for drainage easement, and we had an inquiry from a property owner about a permit, and we discovered um, that we the, the property was encumbered with this easement and it was causing some difficulties for some improvements that that property owner wanted to make. And so when we reviewed the situation, we've determined that the easement 
um, was originally master plan in section one of that subdivision. Uh, we went back and reviewed the master plan, the drainage plan, and the drainage plan was modified with the future section so that this easement was no longer needed. And so tonight we bring to you a request um, that we abandon that easement and then uh, we would take that to council also for consideration of quit claiming that easement on those properties. There's a map attached showing how the easement was recorded with section one. And then there's also a uh, color vicinity map showing um, the lots that it would affect as well. Um, it's a fairly straightforward easement. I did get a statement from the design engineer uh, that uh, it was his opinion that the easement was no longer needed and I also reviewed it with other members of our planning and engineering staff and we agreed uh, that the city has a, does not have a need to keep the drainage easement. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Any questions? Thank you. If there's no questions, we're ready for a motion. Move for approval. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Charleston. Mr. Aylott, do you have anything else this evening? No, sir. If there's no further business, we stand adjourned. Thank you.